All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3430 Operating Systems. Today, uh, we're going to we're going to switch topics a little bit. Um, so the the hardware stuff, the drivers and stuff, uh, we're just going to leave that for now. We're going to leave that for now. And there is some time that's left over in the last week of the course that hasn't really been accounted for. And that might be where that goes when we come back to it. We're going to talk a little bit about hardware today in the sense that I want us to be familiar with some terms related to the layout of a hard disk. I want us to be able to describe parts of a hard drive or a hard disk. And this is motivating some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about with regard to file systems. So we're going to be talking about the abstraction of file systems. How does a file system actually go onto a disk, physically on a disk? Where do all these bits go? Then we're going to talk about file systems. We'll talk about the abstraction of a file system. We're going to be talking about two different file systems in this course. The one that I want to spend some time talking about today is called VSFS. This is the file system that's described in the textbook. But there are some things that are, well, the textbook is great. The textbook is great. There's some stuff that it just helps to go through the process of like stepping through and visualizing what's going on with the file system, especially since this is a data structure. It's an applied data structure. So I want to spend the time doing that today. Uh, the other things, some other announcements that I want to make, um, the term test, the term test. So I made a video to give you an opportunity to do some self-assessment if you haven't seen that already. Uh, the graders are 99% finished. And I am going to say that you will, I'm going to guarantee this, you will get it back this afternoon. Before I leave today, I will send the exams back to you uh, so that you've got Lots of time before Thursday. Uh, Thursday's the VW date, so um, just to give you a sense of where you're at in the course um, before we get too far into it. The other thing I want to do is, uh, I think tomorrow's class, I'm going to like just set aside some time for questions about the assignment, questions related to MLFQ, questions related to uh, condition variables. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable asking questions in class, I never felt comfortable asking questions in class. I was always the student that sat in the back row and always showed up to class, but then never said anything to anybody, not even my peers, because I didn't have friends when I was in school, because, oh, yeah, oh, oh I didn't have friends when I was in school, uh, because I was a bad person and I didn't make friends. Uh, I have friends now. I have friends now. I'm a better person now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are all my friends, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I have friends like, like Rob. I've got friends like Rob, and I also have not just work friends. I'm really digressing. Uh, I was not the kind of person that would like to ask questions in class, and I totally empathize with that. If you have a question that you want to ask and you don't want it to be like, hey, you, what's your question? Send me an email today. Send me an email today. Send me an email just before class tomorrow. Give me like 20 minutes at least. Give me 20 minutes of lead up time so that I can put your question into a slide deck and I'll present your question anonymously uh, if you'd like to do that. Or alternatively ask questions on the forum, but um, I'd prefer if we're going to do this in class uh, to get questions for, for class time specifically. And yeah, so I want to give a chance for you to ask some questions about that tomorrow. So if you have some questions that you've got, please send them by email. Right, so file systems. I've got a lot that I want you to be able to do by the end of today's lecture, but these are ongoing. They're almost all going to be ongoing throughout the week, as opposed to just today's lecture. So please don't, don't be overwhelmed by the number of things I'm talking about here uh, in terms of file systems and stuff. I want you to be able to describe the physical structure of a hard drive. We're going to be taking a look at seven or eight different terms that I want you to be able to use in, in a description of a drive. And we're going to be using that when we're thinking about how file systems are organized on a physical disk. 
I want you to be able to describe the data structures used to represent files and directories as seen in a Unix-like operating system or a Unix operating system. There are two things that I'm looking for you to be able to do here. One is open Windows Explorer or Mac Finder and tell me what folders and files and stuff are. They're related to each other in the form of a tree structure. That's the kind of the lower level thing that I'm thinking about. The higher level thing that I'm thinking about here are the actual data structures, like COMP2140 data structures that are used to represent files and directories in a file system. So we're going to be looking at certain terms that we're going to use to name structs. So not necessarily data structures, but structs, like a C struct. We'll be talking about abstract data structures that are used to represent the relationship between files and folders. Surprise, they're trees. Surprise, they're trees. Uh, but then also things like linked lists and indirection. I want you to be able to describe how a specific file system is implemented. Again, you're gonna, we're going to do this twice. We're going to do this once with VSFS, and then you're going, we're going to do it again with a file system that's called EXFAT. VSFS is nice because it's straightforward. EXFAT is nice because it's a real actual file system. This USB drive here, this tiny USB drive that I'm holding in my hands right now, this has an EXFAT file system on it. This is a real thing that's used in real production on Windows machines, on SD cards, on USB drives, everywhere. EXFAT is a real thing. VSFS is something that's in uh, an operating system, but it is uh, meant to be an educational academic operating system. It's not a real file system that's used in practice anywhere. I also want you to be able to show how common file operations are performed in terms of manipulating a file system's data structures. This is very closely related to being able to describe the data structures used to represent files and directories. So what happens, for example, when I append to a file? There's a file that exists. What data structures are modified when I add more stuff to the end of that file? What data structures are modified when I delete a file? What data structures are modified when I make uh, changes to the name of a file? What data structures are modified when I add a new file to a folder structure? So what kinds, uh, what parts of the file system are done, are changed when we do those common file operations in terms of uh, making changes to files and folders? All right, so. I want to take a look at some drives, and I want to be able to define some specific terms related to drives. The first one, uh, we're going to straight up say, um, this is a disk. This is a disk. This is a disk. And then I'm going to step through each of these terms. I've tried to make it so that I can uh, do this. So hopefully, we can all see what I've got here, because I'm pretty sure people at the back cannot see what I'm holding in my hands right now. So let's take a look at each of these things. And we're going to take a look at the different parts of this drive. And then once we've taken a look at some of the parts of the drive, we'll start thinking about file systems and how those map onto this physical drive. All right, so this is a hard drive. This is a hard drive. This is a fairly recent hard drive. Uh, this is a. 250 gig. This is not the right cover for this drive. This is like a three terabyte serial ATA drive uh, that went bad. Just got disks at home that go bad. So it's, this is a bad drive. Uh, I didn't sacrifice this drive. No drives that were working were harmed in the, in the process of getting this example going. This is a drive, and I'm going to Hold this up here, and we're going to take a tour of the parts. Of course, focus is going to be a crazy issue because this is a very shiny surface. These things here, and I'm going to hold this on an angle here. You can see that there's three of them. These are the platters of the disk. and They rotate. They spin. A common kind of 
A uh, negative term to describe hard drives like this is spinning rust. These are like iron oxide um, platters. Platters on the disk have two up to two surfaces, the, the top and the bottom. So if I were to take these out of here, and I, I can't really like bend them because they're really thick. But if I were to take these out of here, there's two surfaces, the top and the bottom of each of these platters. So in this hard drive, there are three platters and there's two surfaces per platter. So six surfaces in total. Sandwiched in between these is the drive heads. That's this thing right here. The way that this thing works, and it's kind of hard to see, but you can sort of see it there, is that every surface gets a head. And I don't know if you've ever heard hard drives clicking before. If you've heard that sound of a drive clicking on a server or something, that's this, like, moving really quickly back and forth like this, very, very fast. So these are spinning super fast. I think this is a 7200. This was a 7200 or 5400 RPM drive. They're spinning quite fast. The heads are moving back and forth and reading the changes in magnetism as we go from one spot to the, to the next. Every one of these surfaces has a series of like concentric circles that go around it. So when we put the head in this location here and we spin it, the, the circle that's under the head right now is called a track around this disc. So every surface is composed of these concentric circles. All of these are called tracks. We've got this stack of platters. And there's a, a track that's on the top surface, and then another track that corresponds to that on the bottom surface. And then on the next platter, the two surfaces there. Then on the next platter, the two surfaces there. All of the tracks that are just sitting right on top of each other, that's called a cylinder around the disk. And this disk is made up, each of these tracks then is made up of like these array of, uh, here, let me see if I can do a better job of this. So every one of these surfaces here has this kind of like ray here. You are not cringing as much as I, was, as I would expect people to cringe about somebody scratching the surface of a disc right now. So I've scratched that into it. You can kind of see it there. There's like this V shape. There's a bunch of tracks tracks around here and then within these kind of angled spots there are sectors within this disk. So we've got platter, surface, track, sector. That's kind of the way that we're going down in terms of the physical layout of the disk. And here I am, I'm holding the disk against the monitor with a corner and I'm just like pushing it into it and please don't tell anybody that I'm doing that right now because I don't want to break this monitor. So every one of these tracks has a group of sectors around it. The number of sectors, we're going we're gonna to abstract this a little bit. We're going to say that the number of sectors per track is the same for every track. So as we get further away from the center, the tracks get bigger, but they're holding the same amount of stuff. The uh, sorry, the sectors get bigger, but they're holding the same amount of stuff. We're going to say that the sector has a fixed size. On hard drives, yeah, the reflection there, sorry. On hard drives, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. On hard drives, the sector size is commonly 512 bytes. On some more modern drives, it's 4096 bytes, 4K for how big a sector is. Uh, I'm going to let you take a look at this. Feel free to smash the heck out of this drive if you want. I've got another one here. Um, this other one that I've got is a two and a half inch drive. This is a 10K, uh, 10K RPM drive, so it's falling apart. This is just a little server drive, basically. Oh, this one, the platters come out. The platters come out of this one. I'm gonna switch back to the other screen, but I'm gonna give you this one. 
But even though this is miniaturized, it's the same set of things. There's platters, there's heads that are moving around, surfaces, and so on. The other thing that I want you to take a look at is uh, I've got some floppy disks here. I've got some floppy disks here. Um, these are quite old. These disks are older than I am. These disks are older than I am. Uh, these are from uh, Macintosh. This is System 7.5, which is like, I don't know if you've seen Macs before, but they're like the tiny little, L not LCD screen, the tiny little actual monitor inside of it. They're like little nine inch things. These uh, are very similar in structure to hard drives. They're really, really similar in structure to hard drives. They're really, really sim similar in structure to hard drives in the sense that there is a disk, we have a disk. We call this a floppy disk because even though it's rigid plastic, the disks that came before this were actually floppy and you could flop them around. Uh, inside of this, if you move this little window over like that, these are bad disks, it's so very sticky. Uh, inside of here, this little circle that I'm showing, again, very small, I'm gonna pass them around so you can actually see this. This little circle has got, uh, it's moving uh, another, platter in here. I'll call it a platter. It's not really a platter. There's no head in this disk. The head is in the drive that you push this into. So the heads are actually physically located in that drive. But we can have single-sided and double-sided disks. We can have one, one surface or two surfaces on these disks. However, we have sectors and tracks on these in the same way that we do hard drives. So we've got tracks that are concentric circles that go around this. And then as we open this window, we're actually kind of looking at approximately a sector on this disk, approximately a sector. So here, I'll pass these around. If you want to take a look at them. Didn't they used to be bigger? They used to be bigger, yes. Uh, they used to be like five and a quarter inch disks. And then before that, there was like eight inch disks. And then before that, well, then it's kind of like taking a field trip. Oh, just chuck it down there. Yeah, yeah. OK. <laughs> before that, uh, hard drives and stuff were like washing, mach washing machine sized things. OK. So. We've got disk, we've got platter, we've got surfaces, we've got heads, tracks, cylinders, and sectors. Platter is something we, we actually don't care that much about in terms of what we're thinking about with file systems. That's not something that's super useful to us. Surfaces are also not super useful to us when we're thinking about file systems and abstracting what file systems are. The things that we can kind of think about that are interesting for file systems are tracks. This is something that we're going to need to know a little bit about. And sectors. Those are the main things that we need to care about. On a drive, on a disk, when we are reading and writing sectors, they are 512 bytes or they are 4096 bytes. Reading and writing sectors is an atomic operation. So reading a 512 byte chunk from a drive, you either read it and you get the whole thing back or you don't read anything. Writing to a disk is the same thing. You either fully write a sector to a disk or you don't write anything to a disk. So when we're thinking about file systems, sectors are kind of the atomic physical units of the drive that we're looking at. The other thing that I want to talk about, so these are the physical characteristics and the physical description of drives. Other terminology that I want to think about is related to the logical layout of a disk. So we've got a physical structure for a disk. Disks can also have logical structures that are attached to them. So I'm going to open up um, my disk utility here. And on my disk utility, I've got 
a one terabyte disk in my laptop, it's, of course, it's not a disk. Uh, it's like, it's SSD. So it's just a bunch of chips. It doesn't really have the same physical layout as a drive, but it still tells the operating system that we're talking about sectors and tracks and stuff. So SSDs are still telling us, uh, telling us this stuff. On this physical disk, I have several logical partitions. So this is a way to kind of organize the, 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 the drive's contents. At the beginning of this volume, here is this tiny 2.1 megabytes of free space, which is nothing there. After that, we've got a 1.1 gigabyte FAT partition, file allocation table partition. A partition here is going to be when you put a drive into your computer and you can see that there's different disks attached to it and you double click on one of them and it shows up and you can have an explorer window or a finder window open. This corresponds to something like the D drive. After that, I have another 4.3 gigabyte FAT partition here that's got something on it, it's got stuff on it, but this would be like the E drive on my computer. Then I've got this very big one terabyte partition that itself has smaller uh, things in it, but this is a big partition on my disk. So I've got a bunch of small partitions. I've got one big partition. And what I'm using this for, or what this is being used for, is to have our machine kind of appear as though it has many disks installed instead of just one. On each of these partitions, I have something that's called a volume. And the volume here is going to be the file system. This is the actual data structure for the file system. So I want to, I don't want to just yell all that out to you. So I'm going to write it down. I'm going to write it down. On top of the physical structure of the drive, we have some logical structure. Uh, let me get a pin here. Logical drive structure. So we've got the actual disk. That's the whole thing. That's the entire disk that we've got that represents, in this case, a bunch of chips, but in those cases, the actual physical drives that we've got. On the disk, we have many partitions, so one or more partitions. And partitions are uh, just logical separation of the disk. And this is what we're going to see when we're looking at something like C colon backslash, D colon backslash, E colon backslash, for something like a hard drive. These will be the different drives that we have um, attached to our system. On the partitions, we've got volumes. And the volumes are what have our file systems on them. The volumes have the file systems on them. The file systems that are on each of those volumes can kind of be whatever we want them to be. They can be whatever we want them to be in terms of file systems. And we'll take a look at a list of file systems in just a second. Some additional terminology here. When we take a volume and we have, uh, we want to be able to read it on our system, in Linux and on Unix systems, what we're doing with this is we are mounting the file system. So I'm going to plug my USB drive in right now. And when I plug this thing in, I've plugged it in, and it appears on my system as a folder. It appears on my system as a folder. This file system that's on here is, I think on there is an EXFAT file system. It has been mounted onto my system into a folder so that I can start exploring and interacting with the contents of the file. I'm gonna pop over my terminal here really quickly, and I'm gonna say this on my Linux system. I'm gonna run the mount command. The mount command is telling me these are all of the different file systems that are currently mounted on this computer. 
dev SDA1 on Linux, on Linux, there is something called the dev file system. SDA here, SDA corresponds to my disk, my USB drive. SDA1 corresponds to partition number one on that drive. And what it's telling me is that it's mounted to this location. So there's a folder that's called media, F Bristow, and then Ventoy. Complete aside, if you're like trying to install Linux and stuff on your system or Windows or whatever, Ventoy is a great tool. You like format the drive and then you just drop ISO files onto it and then it's a multi-boot thing. It's great, it's awesome. It tells us that this partition is mounted to this location and I can do things like typing in LS. I can start interacting with that. Media, F Bristo, Ventoy. And there's a bunch of stuff in there. And it tells me what the type is. So type is here is EXFAT. This is an EXFAT formatted partition or volume on this disk. So physical structure, platters, surfaces, heads, tracks, cylinders, sectors, logical structure. We've got disk, partitions, volumes, file systems. What's a volume? The volumes are kind of like files. They're kind of like files on a Linux system. Um, the volumes are, it's kind of just, it's an, it's an abstract idea that sits on top of a partition. Yeah. So when I want to create a new partition, uh, I'm going to do this. If I want to make a new partition and if I want to change the file system, I want to change what's on the partition's volume, I can do things like makefs.exfat. So makefs.exfat is a command that will let me create a new file system that is formatted as exfat. And I can pass to that evsda1. So I'm saying here, please format partition one of this drive as exfat. And if I run this and I carefully type in my password, it's mounted and it won't work. <laughs> if I unmount this disk and I rerun this, no such file or directory because I removed it from the system. This is a really bad example. A volume is just a way that I'm I and other people are describing what's on a partition, what's actually on a partition. And it's usually a file system that's attached to that, yeah. And it immediately mounts it, and I don't want to. It's remount. There, I did it. I put a new exfat partition on this, an exfat volume on this, uh, on this partition. Okay. I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of file systems right now. There are a lot of different kinds of file systems. On Linux systems, the most common file system is the ext family of file systems. And there are several different versions of this family of file system. There's ext, which was like 1992 or something when Linus Torvalds was starting the Linux kernel. There's ext2, ext3, and ext4. The differences between these file systems is that ext2 is mostly an evolution of ext. EXT3 adds journaling, which is a topic we'll think about next week. And EXT4 adds extents, which is something we will not talk about at all in this course. On Linux and on uh, Linux, on Linux, this is the most common file system. There's lots of file systems that people will use, but this is kind of the one main default option right now. On Windows, there's the FAT file system, the file allocation table. 
There have been many versions of this over the years. So FAT, then FAT12, which is 12 bytes for the structure that's being used to represent a file, and then FAT16, and then FAT32, and then EXFAT after that. EXFAT is the current version of this. They all have a common heritage and they all share very similar data structures to each other. It's just changing the size of pointers mostly that are being used to represent files um, and folder structures. There's the NTFS. This is new technology file system. I really don't know what the NT actually stands for, but this came along with Windows NT, which is old itself. Uh, this is what most Windows systems are using for the main partition on the drive. So when you install Windows, you're usually installing it onto an NTFS partition or volume. Modern Mac systems use APFS. APFS is different from EXT, FAT, and NTFS in that all of these file systems typically work on a single partition. I want to format partition one as EXT. I want to format partition two as FAT. I want to format partition three as NTFS. Typically, when we use these file systems, it's uh, attached to single partitions on a drive. APFS is a file system that sits on top of multiple drives, one or more drive. And the way that it is working is that it will take things like I've got flash, fast flash storage. Thanks. I've got fast flash storage, and I've got a bigger hard drive that's slower. And I'm going to figure out how to balance reads and writes between those two things. ZFS is a file system that's similar to APFS in that you give it a bunch of drives, and it manages those drives itself. ZFS adds features on top of uh, what things like EXT, FAT, and NTFS do, like doing things like checksums. And the idea here is that when you put a file onto the file system, it calculates a uh, hash. So think back to 2140, you were doing hash tables, cryptographic. Uh, you were doing not cryptographic checksums and hashes, but you were doing hashes. Here's some input, a string usually. Here's a number that corresponds to that, but it's a unique number that corresponds to that. Checksums for files. I'm going to put a picture on this file system and calculate a hash for that picture and store it as part of the metadata for that file system or for that file so that when I read it back, I can check to see that the file that I've read back is the same as what I put on the system a long time ago. I use ZFS at home on my server at home uh, because it's where I put up the pictures of my children. And I want to make sure that the pictures of my children are good copies of the pictures of my children. Um, so I, I use that at home personally, and I have that sitting on top of uh, eight drives, eight drives, and there are like four and six terabyte drives. It's not just pictures of my kids. I also, you know, like back up, back up TV shows and stuff there. Yeah. Don't tell people that I do that too. The other one is uh, BetterFS, BTRFS, and this is a modern file system for Linux that is intended to replace the EXT family of file systems in the long term, and that's starting to happen now. And it is behaving more like APFS and ZFS in that you give it disks, and it's able to manage those disks entirely. I'm never going to ask you about these file systems, except for EXFAT. That's the one I'm going to ask you about. I'm never going to ask you about these file systems. I'm not going to ask you to list them for me in any way, shape, or form. I'm not going to ask you to tell me about them. I just want to give you a sense of the kinds of file systems that there are out there. And I want to ask you this question. Why might there be so many different kinds of file systems? Why are there so many different kinds of file systems? Everyone thinks they can do it better than the person before them. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Use case. Yes. OK, so I really like that. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rephrase what you said. And I want, to, I, I want you to like nod and to confirm that what I'm saying is accurately representing what you're saying. I'm going to use the word workload to describe this. So we talked about this word workload with scheduling. 
And the workload that we have with scheduling is like, these are the tasks and these are the kinds of tasks that I'm running on this system. Use case here is uh, what kinds of files are you trying to put on this system and what do you want to use them for? Does that represent what you mean? Yeah, okay. So like my use case is I want to have long-term storage of pictures of my kids. I want to use a file system that can enable that and support that. I want to have files that I don't care that much about, backups of stuff that are backed up on the internet already. I'll put that in a file system that gives me fast access to big storage and I don't care about the data that's there. Some workloads that we've got might be you've got lots and lots of really small files. So if you're creating many files, uh, let's say like imageflip.com or meme generator or whatever, they're making lots of tiny files, so on the size of kilobytes, but they're making lots of them, like lots and lots and lots of them. Image hosts like Imager or Reddit or whatever, they are having the same problem. Lots of really small files, but lots and lots and lots of them. So pick a file system that's going to let us have lots and lots and lots of really small files. That's great, thank you. Can you think of any other reasons? Yeah. Yeah. Pros and cons. So taking a look at the properties of each file system and trying to make a decision about which one best fits your needs. Yeah. 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 Yeah, over time they approve. This person uh, here, 14 ridiculous, we need to develop one universal standard that covers everyone's use cases. An another alternative to that is, I think that file system sucks and I'm just gonna make my own. I think it sucks and here's why. I'm gonna build my own and it's gonna be better and then soon there are 15 competing standards. Yeah, yeah. Availability, so whether or not it's proprietary. And that is actually related to this, like NTFS for a long time and still is as a closed source for, as part of the Windows file system, um, part of its operating system. We don't want that. We want to have something that we can use other software to read and write. So let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of similar to the space question. Demand, like just the demand for Yeah, so the size of disks as it increases. The FAT file system, the original FAT file system was designed for disks that were megabytes in size, like 20 megabytes. And I don't know where that disk went, but three terabytes is a order of magnitude or two bigger than 20 megabytes. It's huge compared to that. FAT wouldn't even be able to address all of the space on that drive. So yeah, that's great. One, one last one, yeah. Uh, oh, what? Yeah, that way we not have the uh, And uh, uh, yeah, we, three, we have that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, PTR applied, the yeah, FI to the of the FI. Yeah. So kind of like different file systems are going to have different features and that's related to the use case. I want to make sure that when I'm writing stuff to my disk, I want to have journaling because if the power goes out, I want to make sure that I'm able to recover the file systems data structures. I may not be able to recover the data, but I want to make sure that my data structures come back up in the system. Copy on write, I want to be able to save space on the disk that I have. So I'm going to make a copy of something, but I'm only going to actually physically make a copy of it if I make changes to one of those two copies. Yeah. So we have different needs for different file systems. Those are all great reasons for why we would have all of these crazy different file systems. So thank you all for sharing those. Like I said, I want to take the time to step through this file system. I want to take the time to step through this file system and start to think about what the structure looks like, how it kind of corresponds to the physical disks that we've got, 
and how the data structures work, what we're looking at with VSFS almost in a lot of cases directly applies to EXFAT, which kind of seems weird because they're really very different file systems and different operating systems. Um, but they're very related to each other in the form of some of the structures that we're going to be talking about. So in the textbook chapter on file systems, this is the file system that's being described by the textbook, VSFS. This is part of an operating system called XV6 um, that is made by MIT. I think it's made by MIT. Um, and it's made as a learning uh, operating system source where this would be something like um, operating systems two, where you're starting to actually build features onto a file system. VSFS is really, really similar to ext2 and ext3. It's really, really similar in terms of ext2 and ext3, so close that you can almost say that they're the same file system, almost say that they're the same file system, especially if you squint a little bit. I'd like to take the time to step through some of the parts of this file system. So I'm going to be drawing some pictures to go along with that. So let's take a look at our disk. Let's take a look at how the file system is going to sit on top of that. The first thing I'm going to do is we've all seen our disks here. And our disk has this idea of tracks. I'm going to pick a different pen color here to represent my tracks. My disk has a bunch of tracks that are going around it. So one of these here, this is a track on my disk. My disk's physical structure, all of these tracks have sectors. Black. So this is going to be one sector on a track. But everything's circle shaped. Everything is circle shaped. We're going to be taking this kind of circle shaped thing and stretching it out into a straight line so that it's easy to see. It would be really hard to draw this as a circle, so I'm just going to be making it flat. When I think about file systems and when I think about this organization of a disk, it's as an array. It's as an array of sectors. Our sectors are numbered starting at like one or zero, and they go up to some number that corresponds to how many bytes are available on this drive. So I'm going to write a tiny little zero here, and I'm going to say that this is sector zero on my drive. Physically next to that is sector one. Physically next to that is sector two. Physically next to that is sector three. At a certain point, we go to the next track, but then we have contiguous sectors around it. And then we go to the next track, and then we have contiguous sectors around it. That's how we're going to describe this idea. When we're thinking about file systems, we actually don't really talk about sectors anymore. We don't talk about sectors, but we instead talk about blocks. A block is something in VSFS and EXT that corresponds to one or more sectors. So the, the base unit in our file system is going to be a block. When we talk about EXFAT, we're going to be using the word cluster to describe this, but it's the same idea. Yeah. A block management thing. It's related, yes, I guess. It, it's just the same word, I think. It's not the same idea, yeah. Our file system is going to consist of a bunch of blocks. Blocks are made up of sectors. That's, that's how we're using that term here. Uh, in terms of blocks of memory, I guess you could kind of say like, a block of memory is 32 bytes or something. 
and you have to request blocks from that chunk of memory. Maybe that's how we're using that term. Yeah, it's the same idea then, but it's just applied in a different way. Yeah. So in VSFS, I'm going to start by drawing this big rectangular structure here. In VSFS, we have 4K blocks, 4 kilobyte blocks. And if we do the arithmetic here, that's 4096 divided by 512 bytes per sector. Oh my god, I can't do this math in my head. 4096 divided by 512. It's eight. There are eight sectors per block. Yeah, OK. There are eight sectors per block in VSFS. This is something that is changeable in a structure that comes at the very beginning of our file system. Here's the start. So this is at 0 kilobytes. This is at 4 kilobytes. This is at the very beginning of our structure. The very first block in this file system is called the super block. This is four kilobytes of a structure that represents metadata about the whole file system. Metadata for the full file system. So data about the data, metadata about the file system. Metadata about the file system. The metadata that we're talking about here is stuff like block size, The super block will have some predictable amount of space where we can read up to a certain property and determine what the block size is for the data blocks that are in the system. It will tell us things like, possibly, how much space is used or free, kind of like a summary of how much space is available in the system and how much is, uh, is currently used. And it may also have things like the name that's attached, or I'm going to write a label here instead of name. A label for the file system videos or so, something like that that's human readable. It's not actually used by the operating system in any way. It's used by us to be able to look at that and read about it. So the super block has metadata about the file system. And it's also going to have uh, addresses. Addresses or offsets. for some file system structures. So when we're trying to read data from this file system, we'd start by looking at the super block. When I did that mount and unmount operation, I plug that drive in, and it mounts it to a folder. The mount operation is going and reading the super block. And it's using the super block to do things like display what the label of this volume is on uh, my file explorer. So our super block has metadata about the file system. In VSFS, what comes immediately after the super block are two structures here. One of them is called the inode bitmap, and the other one is called the data bitmap. These are each going to be one block in size. Uh, this is 12 KB. Bitmaps here are corresponding to not paint, not MS Paint, it's not us drawing pictures and stuff. 
A bitmap here is used to indicate whether something has been allocated or not allocated. This is going to be a long sequence of just ones and zeros where each position in that one in that long sequence of one or zero. So position zero in the inode bitmap corresponds to position zero of a structure somewhere. Position one in the inode bitmap corresponds to position one in a structure somewhere, whether or not it has been allocated. I'm going to draw that structure that we're talking about so that I can make clear what that means. I'm going to make clear what that means. What comes immediately after that is a sequence of blocks that are filled with inodes. So I'm going to label this here. I'm going to say dot, 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 because there's several of these. These are inodes. These are a series of structs. So we're going to, in C, we're writing a struct that corresponds to an inode. One inode refers to a one file, one file. One inode refers to one directory. One inode, one file. A file may have several inodes, but one inode refers specifically to just one single file. These are structures. So I'm going to draw something that looks like this. These are not just a sequence of ones and zeros. These are actual structures here. And in really, really tiny prints, I'm going to say that this is inode number 0. This is inode number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, seven, and then dot, dot, dot after that. So there's this sequence of inodes. This is just an array of inode structures. Each of those inodes, we're going to say, is 256 bytes. So one inode corresponds to one file. This is metadata about a file. This tells us how big the file is. It tells us how big the file is. It tells us things, so how many bytes? How many bytes or blocks this file is? It tells us things like permissions on the file. So when I was listing FIFOs, there was that long string of RWX. Those are their permissions that our file has. The permissions that a file has fit into this inode structure. And this also has addresses or offsets. To data, to where the actual contents of this file are. So we've got a structure that has some stuff it's got a uint 64t that says how many bytes this has. It's got eight bits or nine bits or whatever that say what the permissions are for this thing. And then we've got addresses or offsets to where the data is actually located on the drive that corresponds to this file. So there's like indirection here, levels of indirection that we've got. As we add files to our file system, we create new entries in this inode table, in this inode table. I cat redirect hello.txt. I create a new entry in my inode table for hello.txt. I file save as sa.docx, and I create a new inode in my inode table here that corresponds to sa.docx. 
our operating system needs to be able to keep track of which inodes have been used and which are free because when I delete a file, I'm going to remove an inode from this table. I don't want it to be there anymore, so I'll delete it. I'll zero it out. I want to make sure that that is free for use by some other file that I want to add to this system. The way that it does that is it uses this inode bitmap to very quickly determine which of our inodes are used and which ones are free. So let me draw a little arrow here. I'm going to use a different color. I'll use gray. This is us zooming into the inode bitmap. The inode bitmap itself, I'm going to draw it as though it is an array. And I'll do a little jagged end here that just says it goes off until however big it actually is. Every spot in this inode bitmap is a bit, a single bit. These are all individual bits. And I'm going to number them because it's an array. This is bit number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, dot, 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 dot. We're going to have as many bits in this inode bitmap as there are inodes in the inode table. In my inode bitmap, I'm going to have a bunch of ones and zeros. 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. Position 0 in my bitmap here refers to inode number 0 in my inode table. That this is marked as 1. So I've got a 1 here. This corresponds to position number 0 in the inode table. A 1 here says this inode is used. 1 means inode is populated. So when we're looking for a free inode to use, we look at our bitmap and we say, OK, well, this one is populated, so I cannot use inode 0 in my inode table. Position number 3, so we'll skip ahead there. Position number 3 is a 0. I'll make it pink. Position number 3 here is a 0, and it corresponds to inode table number 3 or inode number 3. Zero means that that one is free. It's able to be used for something new. It's unused. I'm going to change this to be unused instead of free. Do we never delete anything? Yeah, so the, I, I, again, I'm going to interpret your question and just nod along if I'm saying the right thing. And if, if I'm not, let me know. Uh, if I were to delete something, it would be totally reasonable for me to just come in here and say, zero. It's not used anymore. I can just use it for something else. I don't have to actually go in and zero the inode in the table. I can just mark that as unused in my, in my bitmap. Yeah, OK. We OK with that? Generally straightforward? OK. The super block here kind of corresponds to sector 0. The inode bitmap corresponds to eight sectors after that. The data bitmap corresponds to eight sectors after that. And my inode table here corresponds to eight sectors after that. They're all contiguous on the disk. They're all laid out next to each other so that we can access them um, on the disk itself. 
after the inode table, I'll write here table here, the inodes table, excuse me, the inode table. After the inode table, we have the data region. And I'm going to uh, continue my diagram below because it's too full here. It's too full. I want to continue my diagram below. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. And I'll put a jaggy edge. And then another jaggy edge here. And we're still working in blocks in the file system here. But I'm going to say that this is my data region, this whole thing. This goes all the way to the end of the disk. So that whole thing, the rest of the disk is used for data. This is where we're actually going to put our movies and files and stuff. The data region corresponds to the rest of the disk, but this is where the actual data that we want to put in our files goes. This is where all of our stuff, the things that we want to store, goes into our data region. They are numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, dot, dot. They are all eight sectors big, and we're interacting with them as blocks. The data bitmap is the same idea as the inode bitmap, where position 0 in the data bitmap if it's 1, it says this block is used. If it's 0, it says this block is unused. And you can use it for some other file. So that's the overall structure of this file system. That's kind of a high level structure of the file system. We've got super block, bitmaps, allocation structures, allocation structures that are used to indicate whether or not something is used or unused. The inode bitmap corresponds to the inode table itself. The data bitmap corresponds to the data region. And the presence of a 1 says this structure location is used. The presence of a 0 says this structure location is unused. OK with that? Good. OK. I'm going to go down here. And I want to start looking in a little bit more detail at what an inode looks like. So our inode, again, is metadata about about a file, metadata about a file. It's going to have things like permissions, permissions, and I'm going to write mode here when we're looking at uh, system calls that are using file stuff, doing file stuff. We're talking about this mode of the file, this is permissions of the file. It has things like who created it, so the user ID of the person that created it. It will have things like the size of the file in bytes. It will have things like the size of the file in bytes. And then it's going to have references to the data region of the disk. And it calls these block pointers. Block pointers are an array. They're an array of offsets into the volume of the file system. I'm going to say that this is an array that's of size 8. 8 is not an accurate representation of our file system, but it's a representation of a file system. Block pointers here are going to work in conjunction with how many bytes this file has. So let's say we've got this great file. It's called walter.bmp.
is my cat, is walter.bmp. The permissions for this file in the inode table, so in my inode, in the inode table, we're going to have something like uh, R W blank, R W blank, R W blank. The permissions are the person who created this, the first one, can read and write it. The group that this person belongs to can read and write it. And everybody can read and write it. Everybody has access to this thing. It's not a program. We can't execute it. It doesn't make sense to execute a picture. The UID, I'm going to say, is 1,000. And that corresponds to me. So my username is Fristo, but my user ID is 1,000. And I can change my um, username without changing my UID. The size in bytes. I'm going to say that the size in bytes of this file, so our block size is 4096 bytes. There's eight sectors per block. The size of this is going to be, uh, let's say that it's 5947 bytes. That means that it has to take two blocks. It has to take two blocks. It cannot all fit into just one block. So my block pointer is here. We're going to say that this file is going to be stored in the data region starting at data block 0. The block pointers are an array. They don't have actual addresses. They don't have actual addresses. They have block numbers. These are the numbers that are being referred to in the data region itself. So we've got eight entries in this block pointers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Walter.bmp must span two blocks because it's too big to fit into one block. I'm going to say that the block pointers for this file are at position 0 in my data region, so block number 0. And for illustrative purposes, I'm going to draw my picture like this. That's the first half of my picture. I'm going to say that there is something else here. So our file system, we're constantly adding things and deleting things from it. So blocks get used and then unused. And when they're unused, we can reuse them for other stuff. When I was saving walter.bmp, there were no two contiguous blocks, no two blocks that were physically next to each other that I could use to put this file at. So there's something else here. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's Hello World. I, I don't know what it is, but it's not the rest of the picture. The other block that this one is going to use, we're going to say is a block pointer of two. So the rest of my picture now is going to be in block number two. And then the rest of these are going to be like, Either not used, we're not using these blocks for this file, or they can be just whatever. And we can determine how many blocks the file is using based on how many bytes the file is and what the block size of the file system is by looking back at that super block to determine how many blocks are in this file. We OK with that? OK, good, good. No, no, no. So uh, I'm going to repeat your question. Your question is, please, again, nod along if I'm saying the right things. And if I'm not, let me know. Why do we have to have a data bitmap? Why do we even have that? If I can go through and look 
at all of my inodes and just figure out which blocks are used? Is that the question? Yeah. That's a good question. Why, why bother with that? The answer that I have is that going through every inode to find out which one is not used would be a very expensive operation. We could have millions of inodes in our file system and scanning through every single one of those to determine which block is used and not used to get a list of unused blocks would be like prohibitively expensive for us to do that. We could, we could recreate the data bitmap by doing that, but using the data bitmap gives us a very quick way to say these bits are unset so I can use those data blocks without having to scan through the entire tree of the file system. Does that answer your question? OK, good, good. Yeah. Yeah, the iBitmap does basically the same thing, but we can't recover it from inodes because we can't tell the difference between an inode that just happens to be populated, like with something that looks right, that maybe we deleted previously. We can't tell the difference between that and something that's actually not used. So the data bitmap we could recover by scanning through the whole file system of inode structures, but the inode bitmap we can't recover in the same way. We can get something that looks like an inode bitmap back if we're trying to recover data from the system, but yeah. Yeah. The super block holds that header information. Yeah, so the super block has the metadata for the entire file system. The inodes are kind of like the metadata for each file that we have in the file system. Okay. I got three minutes left, and in this last three minutes, I want to do one last thing here related to inodes. With eight block pointers here, uh, we have eight total blocks. Again, I cannot do this arithmetic in my head. Eight blocks times 4096 bytes per block gives us a grand total of 32K, which is uh, not a lot of space for a file. There's not many files that are 32 kilobytes in size. There are lots. There are lots of files that are 32 kilobytes in size, but there are many, many more files that are much bigger than 32 kilobytes in size. So to get around this, uh, we have a level of indirection that is aptly named direct and indirect block pointers. What we've got here are direct blocked pointers. So direct block pointers are the ones that are pointing directly to the data that's in that file. An indirect block pointer, we're going to say that we've got one of these. And my indirect block pointer, I'm going to say that this points at block number three. An indirect block pointer says block number three up here itself is an entire block of direct block pointers. So if we've got 32 kilobytes of direct block pointers, we have a single indirect block pointer. And let's say that we're using integers, 32-bit integers, to represent each block number. Each one of these is 32 bits, or 4 bytes. 4 bytes. If our block size is 4096, we can get 1,024 indirect block pointers. 1,024 indirect block pointers. And these themselves will refer to other data blocks. So 8, and then 10, and then 30, and then dot, 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 dot. Once we fill up the direct block pointers, we can go to indirect block pointers. And this goes beyond the size of the inode. So our inodes are filled, fit entirely in that inode table. We have files that are bigger than what our direct block pointers can point at. So we add this level of indirection. There's the idea of doubly indirect block pointers. 
a doubly indirect block pointer points at a block that is filled with indirect block pointers that themselves point to block pointers, and then trebly indirect block pointers, where we've got a block that's filled with doubly indirect block pointers that points at indirect block pointers that point at direct block pointers. It's a very unbalanced tree. It's a super, super unbalanced tree. What you can do with that information is you can calculate how big a file can be from the inode structure. You've got direct block pointers, indirect block pointer, doubly indirect block pointer, trebly indirect block pointer. You can calculate how many blocks you can point at, and that tells you how big of a file you're able to represent in this file system. OK, so I'm going to pop over here. And what we're going to do next class is I will bring these papers back. I've got some guiding questions that are going to help us assess this file system. So we have the idea of what the structure looks like. I want to be able to ask questions about this file system so that we can compare it to another file system. So next class, we'll do that. VSFS is a file system. It is one file system. You should approximately be able to describe it. We've got structures like inodes, blocks, allocation structures, and trees, and trees, and trees, and so many trees in this file system. Like I said, I will send you your tests this afternoon, and then I will see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone.